We're going to sing an oldie but a goodie, Awesome God. When he rolled up his sleeves, he ain't just putting on the Ritz. Our God is an awesome God. There's thunder in his foot that's a lightning in his fists. Our God is an awesome God. And the Lord, he wasn't joking when he kicked him out of Eden. Wasn't for no reason that he shed his blood. It's turning very close, so you better be believing that our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. God was starless in the void of the night. Our God is an awesome God. He spoke into the darkness and created the light. Our God is an awesome God. In judgment and wrath he poured out on Sodom. Mercy and grace he gave us at the cross. Hope that you have not too quickly forgotten that our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns. From heaven above with wisdom, power, and love, our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love, our God is an awesome God. Our God, God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Everybody go ahead and be seated real quick. We do serve an awesome God, and uh, that's what the psalmist here in Psalm 47 talks about. It says, for the director of music of the sons of Korah, a psalm. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. For the Lord Most High is awesome, the great king over all the earth. He subdued nations under us, peoples under our feet. He chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loved. God has ascended amid shouts of joy, the Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth, sing to him a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations, God is seated on his holy throne. The nobles of the nations assemble as the people of the God of Abraham. For the kings of the earth belong to God, and he is greatly exalted. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and go to this awesome God in prayer. Uh, bow with me. God, you are an awesome God, and we are grateful to be here this morning to stop what it is that we're doing and to praise you. Uh, to think about you, to consider who you are, to consider your ways, and to let those ways permeate into our hearts and change how we live. Uh, God, I pray that this, uh, this morning would not be an empty, uh, uh, an empty practice that we're going through, but something that is fulfilling, uh, something that changes us from the inside out. God, I pray that we would look to Jesus uh, and his example, and that we would be inspired by it, and that we too can try to walk in his ways as we live as his disciples. Uh, God, I pray that you'd be with us this morning uh, in all aspects of our worship service. Uh, but most of all, God, we, we just want to lift up your name uh, with honor and glory and praise because you are due all of those things and more. God, we love you. We pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Let's, uh, let's stand up and we're going to continue to sing. Uh, some of you may not know this song, but it's great. I'm sure you'll catch on soon. Sing about the goodness of God. I 
love you, Lord. And for your mercy never fails me. Now all my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up till I lay my head, and I will sing of the goodness of God. You have been faithful and all my life you have been so so good yeah with every breath that I am able why oh, will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice you have led me through the fire darkest night you were close like no other who oh, known you as a father and I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God and all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so, so good, yeah, every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Sing that again, all my life. In all my life you have been faithful, in all my life you have been so, so All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Yes, I will sing of the goodness You guys sound awesome this morning. We're going to continue to praise with a song called I Give Myself Away. Uh, this song is meant for us to sing as a prayer, meant to be something that we actually mean when we say it. Uh, we want to get ourselves out of the way and give what we have to give to God, whatever that may be, but let's give it all over to Him. Amen. Amen. myself away I give myself away so you can use me give myself away I give myself away so you can use me 
I give myself away I give myself away so you can use me I give myself away oh Lord I give myself away so you My life. My life is not my own. To you I belong. I give myself, I give myself to you. Myself away is not my own. Oh Lord, give myself away so you can use me. Give myself away. So you can one more time. I give myself away. Oh Lord, I give myself away. So you can use me. Amen. Amen, everybody. Please be seated. So to, sh to share our communion thought for today, uh, Peyton has prepared some thoughts, and so let's give Peyton our attention as uh, she leads us to the foot of the cross. Come on, Peyton. Amen. All right. Do you mind helping me with the mic? <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, church. Um, I, yep, that's perfect. Thank you. I have the honor and privilege of preparing our hearts for communion. I wanted to talk about Jesus being our bridegroom and how through the marriage between him and us, the church, we have redemption from our sins. So to give us a little context, we'll be looking at Ruth 3, um, and um, just before 8 through 9, uh, Naomi instructs Ruth to, uh, you know, gives her directions to, uh, 
woo Boaz, <laughs> in a sense. And so um, in verse 8, it says, In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? he asked. I am your servant Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. So when Ruth, in obedience to Naomi's directions, asked Boaz to spread your garment over me, it was Ruth's way of asking Bo Boaz to marry her. Boaz, Boaz's response to that request ultimately resulted in a God-honoring marriage. This language is used elsewhere to talk about marriage. Let's go to Ezekiel 16, verse 8. Oh, okay, so in Ezekiel 16, verse 8, um, the Lord says, Later I passed by, and he's talking about Israel at the, in this time, and when I looked at you, Israel, and saw that you were old enough for love, I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your naked body. I gave you my solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Sovereign Lord, and you became mine. The context here notes God's role as a husband for Israel. Unfortunately, Israel was unfaithful to God. And Israel, like us, needs a savior to reconcile the relationships that are broken because of sin. Jesus provides that reconciliation on the cross. So let's look at Mark 2, 18 through 20. Okay, so Mark 2, 18 says, Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the, but the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. Jesus is the bridegroom of the church, and his disciples are the wedding guests. While they had Jesus, it was time to celebrate. Now, I find the connection and covenant between Jesus and the church very powerful and sweet. Um, as many of you know, I'm engaged to Rob, and so as Rob and I prepare for our marriage this year, I think of the joys and celebrations to come, and I can't help but rejoice. I imagine Jesus is rejoicing in, in anticipation for his union with us when he returns. So as we celebrate his triumph over death, it's also time for us to celebrate. We can celebrate because we know that even though we've been unfaithful to God, Jesus is a bridegroom that has reconciled us to himself with his death and resurrection, which we remember while taking communion. Thanks for letting me share. Let's pray. Good morning, Abba. Thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for who you are, for the way you lived and died. Um, the way you raised again, you are victorious in every sense of the word. And uh, it is so humbling and such a privilege to be here to worship you, God. Um, thank you for the marriage between you, Jesus, and the church. Thank you for that beautiful relationship, that beautiful covenant that you've established with us. Um, thank you for loving each of us individually and collectively, knowing each of us so intimately. Um, help us to yada you as you yada us. Thank you for your love and your faithfulness. Bless this time of uh, meditation and uh, celebration in our hearts, just remembering what you did for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you, God. We love you. We praise you. In the name of Jesus, I pray all these things. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Peyton, for sharing that. Uh, we'll stand now. We'll get ready for the, the sermon part of our service. And we'll stand to sing a song here. Humble yourself. the Lord. Stand and sing. Well, good to see you again. Uh, welcome again. Very glad that you're here. Uh, decided to come and be with the Springfield Church of Christ this morning. That was a good choice. Thank you for coming. Uh, so a couple things. One, uh, you probably saw the communion cups were, were a little different than, bef uh, than we've been doing for like the last two, three years, right? Uh, there's actually like a shortage of those cups. <laughs> you figure that there would be a shortage when it was a pandemic and everybody was using them. But there's a shortage now. I don't know. People got into the habit of using them. And so I'm like, you know what? The, but that's okay. It's fitting. Uh, we got something that tastes a little bit like more like real food and less like styrofoam, uh, which is nice. There's the point. And you know what? I think God did that intentionally for us because today, John 13, we're getting into several chapters in a row that are the Last Supper. And so well, we've got something that tasted like a little bit more like real food, and now we get to talk about the Last Supper, the beginning of this uh, discourse, which goes over several chapters. It's pretty amazing that the first uh, 12 chapters of the Gospel of John are all about Jesus' life, everything that he did. And then John's like, okay, now I'm going to slow things way down, and we're going to take a long time to talk about some really important things that were said during this dinner. That's pretty cool. So we're going to start off in John 13, uh, and I want to ask a, a couple questions for us uh, to set the sermon in context. What if you, in your life, 
were to love without any limits, without any limits at all. You know, Jesus and his life takes away all excuses that we would have to limit our love. And his words and his deeds, if we listen to them and obey them, would guide us to that kind of love, that kind of life. And yet it's still so difficult to try to love without limits. Way easier to put the brakes on than to give of ourselves freely like Jesus did for us. Uh, Look at John chapter 13, verse 1. It says, It was just before the Passover festival, and Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. We'll just stop right there. He loved them to the end. You know, another way to say that, he showed them the full extent of his love, or he loved without limits. And so what what, what would happen, though, if you in your life, you decided, I'm going to start loving people without any limitations, not without any challenges, Uh, Every time that Jesus showed his love, challenges were the result of that kind of love. In uh, In this chapter, we'll see that Jesus washes his disciples' feet. And that, that leads to Judas setting into motion Jesus' arrest and eventually his crucifixion. Later on, we'll see this new commandment that is given to the disciples. And Peter uh, Peter's not uh, too keen on, on, on any of this. He, he, he later then denies Jesus. So things do result from this kind of love. But what if we were to love without limits? My first point is outrageous love. Okay, and we're going we're gonna to read a, a big chunk here, uh, and then I'll, I'll, I've got some thoughts as we walk through. But let's read this uh, verse 1 again, and I'll go all the way down through 20. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not every one was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. I am not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen. But this is to fulfill this passage of Scripture. He who shared my bread is turned against me. I'm telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Very truly, I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. Amen. Amen. So there's a lot going on here. We're going to break it down this morning, talking section by section. But there are five chapters, chapter 13 through 17, that are all focused on this upper room discourse. It's a farewell discourse, and we would be totally missing the point if we did not recognize the importance of these next couple of chapters. 
in terms of percentages, it's a pretty large percentage of the book of John. And so we need to remember these things that are said here at this uh, farewell discourse. It's all done at the dinner table. Um, and Jesus knows that we know that he knows because John has told us that he knows right at the start of the chapter that he's about to be arrested. So what's on his heart at this time? Uh, not just a list of rules, but instead he's communicating to them a principle that he wants them to remember. I want to show you how to love without any limits. Um, this is kind of interesting. We get to see Jesus' timeline, and he very much understood uh, when was the right time and when was not for his time to come. Right? That phrase, we've actually heard it a couple of times leading up to this chapter. But we saw here at the beginning that Jesus knows that his hour has now come. Uh, more than any of the other gospel writers, John emphasizes the fact that Jesus lived on this heavenly timeline. And as he did the Father's will, we can see the development of that theme. In chapter 2, he says, my hour has not yet come. In chapter 7, my hour has not yet come. In chapter 8, my time has not yet come. And then in, even in the chapter before, uh, chapter 12, we see, okay, now things are starting to change. The hour is come. The hour is here that the Son of Man should be glorified. That's in chapter 12, verse 33. And then right at the top of the chapter here, we see that Jesus knew that his hour had come. In, verse, uh, or in chapter 17, later, he then talks to God and says, Father, the hour is come. He realizes that now's the time. Now's the chance. Now's my opportunity to tell these guys some really important lessons that they should walk the rest of their lives with. If you were about to die, and you knew you were about to die, like you, you knew it was coming up, what would you focus on? What was Jesus' focus? Are they different? You know, his focus was on his friends. His focus was on us. It was on you and me. I would be so tempted to focus on myself, uh, to focus on what am I going to be remembered for. Let me, let me make sure that I do whatever it is that I want to do right at the end. After all, I only got a little bit of time left. But with, with his time, he loves and he serves. It's pretty amazing. Um, in verses 5, 6, 8, 12, and 14, there's the word wash that is said. And that, that word is uh, translated as wash. And it means to wash a part of the body. You know? But later, in verse 10, uh, that wash that is used by Peter, that's, hey, I, babe, all, of, all of me. It, it, it's referring to this uh, to this. Uh, Baptis baptism, really. It's, it's referring to the entire, uh, our entire Christian experience, our entire lives needing to be covered over, needing to be bathed with Jesus and his love. Some of the questions, you know, just how, how does Jesus love these people? How does he love these people? And what he does as he loves people is he emphasizes the importance of humility. He emphasizes the power of humility. In other uh, gospel accounts, in, in Luke, we see at this, at this same discourse, this uh, Last Supper discourse, uh, there's a dispute that rises among them. Remember that? It, a dispute rises up and they start talking about, well, who's the greatest among us? And it's in that context that Jesus washes their feet. It was pretty cool last week. Uh, we, we couldn't do two uh, weeks in a row of feet washing from the front. I figured like that was too much. But uh, last week, Michelle acted out John 12 for us and, and showed what a, a marvelous, extravagant, selfless gift it was for her to pour the nard over Jesus' feet and anoint his body, preparing him not only to be king, but to be uh, someone who was going to die. I, I almost wonder that these guys, man, didn't you just remember that like, a couple, like just, just, just a, a moment ago, that Jesus took this act of humility and explained it to be something that was good, and yet they're fighting over who's the greatest among them. Jesus in instead, though, says uh, that it's got to be something different. He shows that it's about really being humble. Love and humility are inextricably connected. However, uh, humility can't and will never be a, a competition. 
Isn't it kind of interesting that Peter's like, okay, I don't want to be washed. I don't want to be washed. I don't want to be washed. And then once Jesus highlights this as the thing that needs to be done, he totally goes all the way to the other end of the spectrum. He says, okay, if anybody's going to be washed, it's going to be me and do all of me. It's like he takes this thing that's supposed to be uh, lowly and humble and uh, he turns it into, hey, <laughs> well, do, do, give it all to me. I, I appreciate that heart. There's a certain energy and enthusiasm that there, and that's, that's, awesome. That, that's awesome. But uh, Peter believes, hey, that, that's too outrageous. No, I don't want it. Uh, you, you're, not, you're not washing me. It would have been so shocking for a, a rabbi, and not just any rabbi, but the Messiah to be doing this for his disciples. Of course, you know, we could get into how disgusting their feet might have been. You know, they probably got sandals. They're exposed to all sorts of stuff, walking around. It was a messy job. But Jesus was willing to take that and to serve his disciples. It takes humility. It takes grace to serve other people. But it also takes humility and grace to allow others to serve us. You know, it's easy to get burned out. It's easy to just focus on, well, what can I do? Let me, let me be in control. I personally, I struggle with this a lot. Um, if somebody asks, hey, what can I do? What can I do to help? What can I do to help? I'm like, oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I got it. Don't worry. It's really easy for me to just deflect. But that, there, there's a, a part of pride that uh, is there as well. It's easy to just uh, shut people down and to not allow them to love you like Jesus wants, <laughs> wants them to be loving you. Humility uh, goes both ways in that way. Mm-hmm. It's a beautiful thing that a, a submissive spirit, or the beautiful thing about a submissive spirit is that it, it can both give and receive to the glory of God. Mm-hmm. And isn't giving and receiving indicative of a healthy relationship? Yeah. If you've got a relationship where one person is just giving and the other person is just taking, that's not a healthy relationship. And God designed us to work in this kind of humble way to both serve and be served as we lift one another up and glorify God. Amen? Amen. You know, lives, uh, lives are just messy. And so when, when we get into life, you know, you just start living life, you realize, man, this is, it's, it's messy. And I know that we've all been through different messy periods of our life, or maybe you're in one right now. There are people that have hurt you. Uh, there are people that you have hurt and it, it gets dirty. It gets a little bit messy, kind of like the dirty, messy feet that Jesus is about to wash. Yeah. And so what is Jesus' response? Well, to get low, to get on people's level, to, to take off the outer garments and to love in a way that will be shocking and not forgotten. Uh, to be humble when other people would look at that act of love and humility and say, what are you doing? That's the kind of love that Jesus gives. Amen. Now, what would happen what would happen if you were to love in an outrageous and surprising way? Are you willing to love when it's, when it's outrageous, when it's, un, when it's unnatural, when it seems like this is, this is strange, it's weird, I, I don't want to put myself out there? Are you willing to love in those circumstances or to love just when it is comfortable for you to love? We've got to have an outrageous amount of love. Let's, uh, let's go to a second point here. I want to talk about that love now being courageous. It should be outrageous, a little bit shocking, a little bit surprising, a little bit countercultural. Actually, actually, it has to be a lot of all of those things. But we've got to be courageous if we're going to go against the normal ways. You know, m- many of us uh, have seen courageous love and are even maybe good at doing it. Uh, it it's when you're obedient to doing the right things and nobody sees it at, at all. That's a courageous kind of love because it's easy to just be affirmed and to be lifted up. But when you love in a courageous way, it's, it's just because it's the right thing to do. Right. You know, think about, uh, think about Judas in this circumstance. Jesus loves him so much that Peter and John never knew who the betrayer was going to be. Isn't that amazing? So Peter and John, the closest guys to Jesus, in his inner circle, Jesus loved Judas so much that Peter and John never knew who the betrayer was. Wow. Can you think about, say, you got your closest group of 12 friends, but you know that one of them's a snake. <laughs> you know one of them is going to betray you. It's going to rat you out. 
It would be pretty easy for me to tell Peter and John about that. How about for you? Are you willing to be courageous in your love? To love somebody so much that you do not expose the gossiper or the slanderer or the betrayer? To, to love you or to love somebody who's hurt, who's hurt you takes an incredible amount of courage. And to continue loving them with forgiveness, not allowing resentment to build up, not, allowed, not allowing bitterness to take root, that takes a tremendous amount of courage. Uh, Jesus uh, quotes Psalm 41, verse 9, and uh, in, in this discourse he says, uh, well, the, the full quotation from that, says, even my friend in whom I trusted, who ate of my bread, has lifted his heel against me. That's Psalm 41, 9. And so Jesus knew, and yet he did not expose, he did not shame, he just chose to love courageously. I want to look at uh, Psalm 55, uh, 12 through 14. I've loved how we've been able to weave in the Psalms throughout the course of uh, our, our services this year. And they, they, there's, always, there's always a connection that can be made. But uh, look at this in Psalm 55, 12. It says, For it is not an enemy who taunts me, then I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals insolently with me, then I could hide from him. But it is you, a man, my equal, my companion, my friend. We used to take sweet counsel together within God's house when we walked in the throng. It's like in the fellowship. It, you know, there, there's a certain kind of hurt when an enemy hurts you. You expect them to hurt you. You expect them to be opposed to you. You know, or wrestled all through middle school and high school. If I got out onto the wrestling mat and the guy's like, I just want to give you a hug, man. Let's not do this. That'd be very strange, right? I'm like, I'm expecting you to be a little bit mean. I'm expecting you to really want to take me down. But when it's a friend who hurts you, that's a different kind of hurt. Yeah, yeah that's a different kind of hurt. Somebody that you trusted, your, your, your friend, your equal, somebody who you thought, hey, you're one of my guys. That's a different kind of hurt. Now, I believe that Judas uh, could have changed. Um, I, I think he also served the purpose uh, that needed to be served for God's ultimate plan. And so it, it gets messy, it's tricky, it's hard to understand. But all I know about this passage is that love doesn't always get the results that we want or we think should play out in the way that we think it should play out. You know, Jesus loved Judas. He, he, never, he never exposed him. He did all the right things. And yet, even after doing all the right things, it wasn't the result that maybe we would have said would be a happy ending where Judas just turns around and says, you know what, after all, uh, you know, I take back what I said about that pint of nard. Mary did exactly the right thing. Oh, and also, by the way, uh, I've really been tempted in these ways, and I, I, I'm, I just want to let you know, get out of Dodge, get out of town. You know, I think Judas could have done all of that. He didn't. And, uh, you know, but, but, but this is part of the nature of love. You, you have to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, not because you'll manipulate somebody, somebody else's actions right. who will eventually do what you wanted them to do. Right. right? That's not love, to just be in control. Yep. Courageous love means that you'll do the right thing and you are okay with whatever the consequences are because you know you're at peace with God and you've loved like Jesus. Amen. 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 Last uh, point here is contagious love, okay? Contagious love. Jesus um, is about to lay down his life for his friends, and there is no greater love than this. But it, it is a contagious love when we live and love courageously and outrageously, okay? When you're outrageous in your love and courageous in your love, it's going to lead to a contagious love love, okay? There's a clear command that Jesus gives to now love others. Um, it's a new command that he says that he is giving them. Let's go back and uh, uh, let's, uh, let's just read this section again. Come on, Josh. Oop, that's in the wrong spot. Um, Yeah, so we're, we're going to jump down to verse 31, and I'm going to read uh, this, this section here. Uh, 
It says, when he was gone, referring to uh, Judas, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will only be with you a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I always told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but, I, uh, but uh, you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. A new command is given to the disciples uh, to love one another as Jesus has loved them. And so, how do we love? How do you love? Do you love like this? You know, sacrificial love is, is real love, according to to Jesus. Uh, there's, there's like a, a way that you can love somebody with niceties. You can just kind of be nice to them. But there's a different kind of love that Jesus is talking about, and it's a sacrificial love, one where you would lay down your life for other people. In verse 4, uh, the words laid aside, uh, and, and, later, uh, uh, and later when he had taken his garments, uh, that's verse uh, 12, they're identical to the ones he uses when he earlier had spoken about his own death as the good shepherd, that I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. This is a pattern that he's been showing us and is now highlighting again. It's, there's an emphasis on getting yourself out of the way, laying your own life down, putting others' needs above your own as you recognize that you're putting your, your needs aside. I'm not saying you forget about what you need and abuse or uh, whatever, just not take care of yourself. No, in order to love others, you have to also love them as you love yourself, right? And so there's kind of a built-in expectation that you're going to take care of what you need to do for you so that you can love other people. But if, it, if you're loving yourself for the express purpose of loving yourself, that there's something that's not quite right in that. We love us because God loved us first, and then as an extension of his love, we love others. Right. But it's this cycle that doesn't just stop with us, and then we just don't let anybody else in. Right. No, it's right. this flow. God's coming in, God's coming out. God's coming in, God's coming out. As he overtakes us with love, it fills us up so we can pour ourselves out again and again. Mm -hmm. But this is the kind of laying down of life that God is referring to here. It's putting down our life, laying aside our own needs as we love others. You know, the, the, the Greeks had uh, a lot of different uh, words for love, and I could bore you with the Greek. I'm actually getting to the point where I actually can bore you with the Greek. i got to pass a couple more tests and midterms, but I'm getting there. Um, uh, I won't do any of it now, though. Just trust me. There's a lot of different words in Greek for love. Uh, our definitions of love can get a little wacky, right? I say, I love pizza. And I love my wife, but the way I love my wife and I love pizza, very different. Pizza's great, but it's not the same. You know, We uh, can be infatuated when, we, when we're talking about love. We can be referring to lust when we talk about love. We could just be talking just about our preferences and opinions when we talk about love. But that's not the kind of definition of love that Jesus is talking about here. It's a sacrificial love, and it's different than these other kinds of loves. If you've got agape love, there you go. If you've got agape love, you are loving others in a sacrificial way. Amen. Think about your, your marriage and your par parenting and your relationships and your church and your neighbors. If you're loving with that kind of sacrificial love, the laying down of life, how would those things change? I bet that they would change and that they would change for the positive. Yep. So is your love a sacrificial love? Well, that's how you measure what it, e what it even means to be a Christian. Because this is the definition. That others would see that love and then know you are my disciples. Yeah. Jesus said, hey, you guys have been with me for three years, walking with me, 
you know, you've seen me heal, you've seen me preach, you've seen me teach, but if there's anything that you got to remember, it's that people are going to know that you followed me if you love like this, if you love to the end, if you love without limits. This is building up to John 15, and uh, we're going to get there. I'm so excited to get there. It actually sets up a big, it's called a chiasm, okay? And so chapter uh, 15, right in the middle of this chiasm, we're going to learn something about Jesus and discipleship and the church right in the middle of chapter 15, but this is leading up to that big exclamation point. But this is a pretty good thesis to start off this discourse. If anybody's going to know what discipleship is like, this is what it's about. It's about sacrificial love. It's about love without any limits. Church, let's have an outrageous love. Let's go beyond our own known boundaries. Push yourself a little bit as you love in an outrageous way that makes other people scratch their head and go, whoa, wait a second, that's kind of crazy. This guy's out there. He's loving outrageously. Let's try to love like that. Let's have a courageous love. That means that we should love those who are difficult to love. The ones who aren't going to give you anything back. The ones who might betray you. The ones who might turn their back on you. Love those people anyway with a courageous love. And then let's have a contagious love. A sacrificial love that changes and continue to changes and continue to change uh, the world around us. Amen. Let's have an outrageous love, a courageous love. A contagious love. Let's love like Jesus. Let's love without limits. Amen. Amen. All righty. Well, thank you, Josh. I appreciate that, and uh, I am encouraged to try to love better. Um, what better way to do that than our Go With God study series? We can share the word with our friends. We can uh, invite others into that, uh, that love. So um, thank you, Josh. Uh, at this time, we're going to do our regular contribution. Um, I've got a psalm that I'm going to read. Uh, we'll pray, and then we'll pass the trays uh, as well. There's always the Tidely app if you're giving online. So uh, we're going to read Psalms 48, 9 through 14. Uh, as we prepare. Within your temple, O God, we meditate on your unfailing love. Like your name, O God, your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with righteousness. Mount Zion rejoices. The village of Judah, uh, villages of Judah are glad because of your judgments. Walk about Zion, go around her, count her towers. Consider well her ramparts, view her citadels, that you may tell of them to the next generation. For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even to the end. Amen. Let's pray. Dear God, uh, we come to you this morning um, just humbled and, and desiring to learn to love uh, as you have called us to love, God. We thank you so much for your son and the example he set for us while he was here um, in, in every way, God. Um, I pray that we can be uh, courageous, outrageous, uh, and contagious God. Uh, I pray that you'll bless the money that we uh, have decided in our heart to give uh, and that you'll multiply it uh, and bless uh, this community, this church, uh, this city, um, and your will be done here on earth. We love you so much. Pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. All righty, we have some announcements now. Um, first of all, we have the single Zoom meeting. That's actually today at 2 p.m. on Zoom. And uh, in addition to that, uh, there'll be, it'll be a short charge uh, on Zoom. We'll do a short discussion, but uh, for those interested, we are going to be meeting at Vicky's house for some board games as well. Um, so come on out and join us. Uh, next up, we got the Sister, Sit, Sister Zoom Fellowship uh, every Tuesday at 1.30 p.m. Uh, right on Zoom. We also have the life groups happening this week. Wednesday is going to be at Linda Squire's home, and Thursday's at the Mayor's and the Williams, and Friday at the Lutz's. Uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and ask anyone, and uh, we can get you connected. Reminder, uh, this Saturday is the church-wide rummage sale from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. Share the event on Facebook with your friends uh, from around the community. Have them come out. It's going to be here in this room, uh, and we're going to be just having a, a rummage sale, a garage sale. Um, Josh, on Friday, will be coming around with a trailer. If you have any larger items that need to be picked up in order to be brought here, um, go ahead and reach out to him, and we can get that figured out for you. Any other notes on that? No? 
Uh, yeah, I'm actually, I've got a bulletin board here. Um, and so if you know, hey, this time works for me on Friday, uh, just write that down. Or also, if, if you know that, hey, I've got a box of stuff, you can just put it on your back porch or your driveway or whatever, and I'll just pick it up. You just let me know that it's there. But I'm, I'm going around town on Friday morning. Um, I'd like to be done by 3. So anytime before 3, if the time works for you for me to meet, then I, I can come and pick it up. Perfect. Sounds good. All right, and uh, next Sunday, back here, 10 a.m., Washington Street Mission for regular worship. We also have the month of May coming up. That is our special missions collection month. That's what we're doing the rummage sale for. Uh, our goal is going to be 20000 and last year we exceeded our goal, so hopefully we can uh, make a good dent this year, too. Um, let's see. Uh, after that, we have volunteering at the Washington Street Mission, Saturday, May 6th. We will be doing um, uh, serving the breakfast that morning and uh, need hands on deck to help out with that. So uh, please arrive here at 8 a.m. that day, and there is a sign-up on the website if you're going to be able to be there. Lastly, we have the Midwest Teen Prom, May 6th at the Brookfield Zoo, uh, registered by April 23rd. So if you know any teens who are interested in going to that, cost is 100 bucks, and details can be found on the Chicago website. Have to register by today. Have to register by today. Sorry, today is the 23rd. Uh, and with that, we have a closing song. So if the worship team wants to come on up, And end it. Hallelujah. is why